Hello, I'm Jimmy Winfield from the College of Accounting at UCT. This semester I've had the challenge of convening a course for a thousand first year students called Financial Reporting One. Uh, I've had the pleasure of doing it, thankfully, with one of my favorite colleagues, Carla Puri. Carla and I have spent uh, a lot of time and energy thinking about how best to respond to uh, this emergency remote teaching environment. And I wanted to share two tools that we put in place in FR1, Financial Reporting 1, this semester. They are uh, a light board and knowledge checks. And I'd like to start with a light board. Now the light board I'm actually using now, except that I haven't really started using it. This kind of fancy text is something that you can actually do with any video editing software. But what you can't do, unless you have a light board, is this. You can't write on your screen. And that gives you all sorts of extra opportunities. Take a look with me. As you know, when it's hard to kind of think through dates, it might be best to draw a timeline. Now in this timeline, we really need three separate years to be represented. We have a year ended 31 December 2020, and then one ended 2021, and then one ended 31 December 2022. That's what we've got in the ledger. By the way, that is a fantastic strategy for anybody who's thinking, oh gosh, I'm not really sure, I've got to do this journal entry, but I'm not sure. Just think about what you're starting with, okay? And what we're starting with is what we've already seen over uh, just to the left here. We've got a you're doing this nice long calculation here and so you're going to do just the same thing because the logic applies just the same way and most likely there'll be a few of them and so we'll just add them together and call them operating expenses accrued operating expenses and you'll see um, that in the balance sheet but if you saw them separately if you saw electricity expense you could write accrued electricity expense here it doesn't matter anyway she decides you know what, there's somebody else she knows, this guy that she can sell the share, her shares to. That's a sale of shares. And of course, he in return will give her money. Um, perhaps he's just a trader and he buys and sells shares on a, on a daily or weekly basis. And maybe he sells the shares to somebody else, this lady over here. And uh, she might sell it to a thousand or a million other people. She may even sell it back to the original owner when she comes back from the island and realizes life's not as amazing on desert islands as, as she imagined. If you'd like to see how to get these numbers, watch here. This hundred is that hundred there. This 40 is this 40 here. This five, that's this five over here. That 55, remember, that's not in these uh, accounts. You can work that out though easily enough. So what is this Lightboard technology? Well, it's a piece of open source hardware, which is basically a glass screen. It's got to be highly clear, ultra clear glass. And it basically is a lot like a whiteboard, hence the name. But it's a Lightboard because It has LED lights in it. Uh, those LED lights are shining down from up here, recessed into the frame. And I have a camera on the other side of this frame on a tripod, like this. It's actually just my iPhone 7 and there it sits over there in the corner and I am on this side of the light board. Here I am. Excuse my terrible drawing. There's my orange marker and here's the back of my head which has a big hole in it. So the secret of a light board is in the LEDs that are recessed into the frame. If we zoom out right now, we'll break the spell and you'll see the wooden frame that I constructed uh, before the semester started. You'll see the black backdrop. 
You might be able to, if I lean in here, you can see the light on my face. That's from the LEDs that are shining into this ultra clear glass and they're making any ink from a neon pen like this come to life, glow really brightly. I think come to life is probably too generous a term for my very shoddy artwork here. But I hope that if you teach a course which relies on more illustrations um, and you have slightly more artistic ability than I do, you can imagine how powerfully you can present your images to students using a light board, as I believe we can present very effectively those worked examples that you saw in the exemplar videos that I just shared with you. All right, there is actually a little bit of literature about the effectiveness of light boards. So why don't we share that now? That means this picture has to go off. And now we can talk about the literature review. There's relatively little because the light board is a relatively new educational innovation. Uh, but Rogers and Botnaro found that there was in fact a modest increase in the academic performance of students who used the light board for their learning versus those who didn't. Um, then there were some nutrition academics that found, like Rogers and Botnaro, that in fact students' own perceptions of their learning using the light board was very positive. And then Perhaps the most comprehensive study to date is Fiorella and Mayer, who found that watching instructors draw illustrations as they orally explain the topic resulted in deeper learning than the same ex explanations for already drawn illustrations. And since they were writing in the Journal of Educational Psychology, they couldn't get away without positing some reasons for that. And I think these reasons are quite interesting. So let's just quickly explore them. In fact, they suggested uh, two broad kinds of reasons that light boards might be effective. And one of those is that light boards confirm, conform sorry, to uh, various cognitive principles of effective multimedia learning. Now, of course, we learn with our brains and our brains uh, require the right sorts of environments for optimal learning. And those sorts of environments conform to these sorts of principles, one of which is called temporal contiguity, uh, which is describing the act of seeing a word or a diagram at the same time as you're hearing the word being spoken, as I did when I wrote the words temporal contiguity. That tends to embed learning better. Uh, another principle is a signaling principle. And the signaling principle is in effect when the instructor is able to point out, to draw attention to the most relevant thing that's going on in the learning process at the moment. And then allied to that, to that is the segmenting principle. The segmenting principle breaks learning up into chunks and says it's much better to learn that way than it is to just see a deluge of a hundred words on a PowerPoint slide hit you all at once. And you can tell, of course, since I'm having to produce these words in real time, that automatically slows me down and segments the uh, learning that I am giving to the student. Uh, and you may look at that and you may think, well, there are other ways to achieve those sorts of things, and no doubt there really are. Um, what I would put to you is that it's unusual to find a way that you can do all of those things and at the same time have the same advantage of using social cues that the light board does. Don't forget, I'm looking directly at you. We're making eye contact of a sort. You're able to see my face, um, which is very important, and we're social animals and we, we interact by looking at each other's faces and we also use our hands a lot. What I'm not doing is I'm not turning around and trying to write on a whiteboard behind me and blocking my face and blocking my hand. Quite a lot of research has um, shown that in fact seeing a hand produce words or illustrations is highly effective. You don't even need the rest of the body uh, apparently, but certainly it seems that the rest of the body can be very helpful too, right? So what you're doing with these kinds of social cues is you're forming a kind of social bond between the instructor and the learner, which can be very effective for their cognition too. Okay, good. Well, that's enough of that. Let's have a look at how this played out for us in FR1 this semester. 
A couple of weeks ago, Carla and I ran a student evaluation on the course. Uh, we got a good response rate, over 80%, 795 students. And you can see here that we got um, an 86% strong agreement with the prompt that the videos were effective for their learning um, and 98% agreement overall. We were very pleased with that and you can see that there, these are just some of the very, very favorable comments that we got. I'm not sure we got any negative comments about the videos and um, this is just a very small selection of all the positive ones we got. Um, I wanted to show you a few other kinds of comments because I thought that they were interesting. Um, one of them drew attention to the fact that uh, they, the Lightboard videos feel a lot to the students like face-to-face -face, um, learning, which is interesting because it doesn't feel that way to me. I'm standing and looking at a camera, um, but you know, somehow uh, for the student it feels more like that face-to-face. -face. And I think that's because of the social cues that are still present in a Lightboard video. Um, there were uh, several people who commented on how it's engaging um, and I think that's probably part of the same kind of idea. Uh, and then there's also uh, a few features that people drew particular attention to. And I thought it would be nice to just mention some of those. People particularly like the images. A few people commented about that. And um, going through examples, I think using that segmenting principle and going through things one at a, at a time seemed to really appeal to people. And also that idea of temporal contiguity came up in that one comment over there about writing and talking at the same time. I thought that was interesting that somebody picked up on that. Um, and then there was another principle of multimedia learning, which is uh, the idea of reducing cognitive load. Um, that was picked up by students and more than one student who mentioned that it was good that they're not too long. We tried to keep our videos to about 15 minutes. Sometimes we push it a little over that, sometimes we keep it on, on the shorter side. Um, it's whatever we manage to fit into that topic. And then one last thing I wanted to show you is uh, the number of comments, which surprised me to be honest, um, that talked about my energy and enthusiasm and passion for the subject. Um, now, I am, I, am, I am told that I have these things in a face-to-face -face lecture. Um, but I didn't expect to be uh, to have that emphasized in this format. And then when I thought about it, I realized, well, actually, I do understand where that's coming from because I think it's part of why I intuited that I would far prefer uh, to go to the trouble of building a light board and doing my lectures this way than um, doing it on a narrated PowerPoint where I'm just kind of a voice coming in um, over the slide. Um, I don't think that I would be able to communicate my, myself uh, in, in that way. I would, it would feel too constricted. So, you know, if you're also a lecturer who likes to put uh, energy and passion into their lectures and you're feeling a little hamstrung by whatever mode of delivery you're using at the moment, I think you should try the light board. And with that in mind, um, I wanted to answer a few other questions that you may have about the light board. Uh, so one of those uh, is what camera do you need and I've just been using my iPhone um, I think it was uh, it's, it's like four or five generations old now but it does shoot in 4k which is quite helpful because it means you can zoom in and still keep a pretty good resolution um, also um, I've been able thanks to Stefan Stein at Silt to um, find a very very powerful video editor which is free um, and that is called Shotcut if you're wondering by the way um, about how long it took me to learn to write backwards. I haven't learned to write backwards at all. In fact, uh, I simply use Shotcut to mirror the image in post-production. So that's the secret to getting the writing to turn out looking correct. Um, if you're wondering about compression, well, Vula actually does a great job of compression just by uploading. They go from two or three gigs to just uh, 10 or 15 megs. Um, then uh, some bad news, I think it's taken me on average about four hours to produce 10 minutes of footage. Now remember we're trying to um, deliver as much punch as we can in every minute of footage so it's, it's all, um, it, there's a lot of learning in 10 minutes um, but also a lot of time in producing it. 
there's something that Carla and I are consoling ourselves with, given how much time is going into this, is that we're going to be able to reuse these videos in whatever mode of delivery we're using uh, in the future. No doubt these videos are going to be helpful to students beyond 2020. Um, another kind of downside is that in order to build my light board, uh, that cost me about 4,000 Rand. I expected it to be cheaper when I set out, but it turned out to um, have rather a lot of costs that kind of accumulated. Um, if that scares you off, then what I want to say to you is that the reason I knew about light boards in the first place was because of Silt. Silt has a light board. I used it last year. It's a great one, much better than the one I managed to build myself. And so if you, don't, if you want to avoid the, the, the uh, expense uh, and the time in producing and building your own, well, why don't you wait until we get access to Silt's and then uh, be the first to book it. Uh, in fact, you'll be able to save yourself time in post-production as well because um, Silt, for a very, very reasonable fee, uh, will edit them for you as well. Uh, before I move on, I want to just say a big thank you to Stefan Stan, whom I already mentioned, the videographer at Silt, who has been very, very helpful, gave me a training session on Shotcut and all sorts of advice about how to build a lightboard and what would be most effective. So thank you, Stefan. And thanks too to Carla, who um, has been able to do so much for the course while I have been spending this um, four hours for every 10 minutes of videos produced in this term. Okay, now, this is a uh, presentation on two things, remember, on not only the light board, but also knowledge checks. So why don't we uh, move on to knowledge checks now? Good. So let me quickly run you through uh, the key features before we do an example. Uh, it's really a form of formative assessment uh, which takes advantage of Buller's tests and quizzes tool and also its lessons tool. The lessons tool has a prerequisites feature which the knowledge checks take full advantage of, basically preventing students from moving on to the next lesson until they've got a certain score for the knowledge check. Now the knowledge checks are not for marks and the students can resubmit as many times as they like, uh, but they must get the certain score in order to progress. Uh, while they are attempting it, they will get feedback to explain why their wrong answers were wrong and to show them what the correct answers are. Um, not only do students get feedback, but so do we. We get, uh, the scores are recorded and we are able to see those. So that's very helpful in our interaction with students um, to know exactly how much they have been engaging and how fully um, and how well they've been engaging with our material. Um, and then one kind of little hidden advantage of Knowledge Checks is that it has um, been a very quick way for us to move up the learning curve for setting assessments in a very low stakes kind of way because it's not for marks, so no students are going to complain very bitterly if we get something wrong. And it's allowed us to, um, to, to very quickly learn a lot about how to set assessments so that um, we can do the difficult job of setting the bigger assessments a little more effectively. Okay, now let's let's look at an example. So this is the landing page for the Financial Reporting One site that we used at the beginning of the year. And uh, this is, uh, we're logged in here as Dummy2, one of our two dummy students. Uh, not a terribly innovative name, but it works for us. Let's just say that Dummy2 has completed lesson one and two of the seventh week of the semester, that's the second week of the Statements of Cash Flows module. And so she's now eligible to go to lesson three, but she can't jump forward to lesson four. You see that it's grayed out. Uh, however, she is ready for lesson three. Lesson three is the third and final part of the cash received from customers mini module. Uh, there's uh, some learning objectives here that she can read through. These are learning objectives for this particular lesson. And then she can learn about how best to engage with the required learning activity. It's one of our Lightboard videos, and she can feel proud of herself that she is in the first 330 uh, views there. If she wants a transcript, she can download that transcript. There she is. Uh, and she could engage with some of the additional recommended learning activities. Uh, that's up to her. Um, and she could even do this additional question if she wanted to, which really embeds the concepts in the video. And when she's ready, she uh, 
needs to do the knowledge check before she can move on. So why don't we do that with her here? She begins the assessment. Here's a, a multiple choice. Which of the following statements is not true? One of those painful not questions. Accrual accounting. Well, does it require accounts to depict the effects of transactions in the period when the effects occur? I think so, but this is a not true one. You know what? I think maybe I'll go for this. So she answers B there. Uh, but she paid close attention when it came to the numbers. A lot of accounting students uh, get turned on by the numbers. And so uh, here she realizes that to work out the cash received from the rental customers, given this information in the statement of financial position and this additional information here about the rent income, all she needs to do is to take that 2.4 million rent income, subtract the opening balance of 156,000, add the closing balance of 230,000, and she gets to 2474. 2474. And she puts that in feeling pretty confident. Um, and then she notices wow, this question looks very much the same, but it's the third question out of three. Um, and it's actually not about rental income. This is about royalty income. And in fact, it appears in the statement of financial position as a current asset, not a current liability like the previous one. And that makes all the difference to the calculation here. Uh, we chose the, the same numbers here, really to draw out this point that it really, the context makes all the difference as to what you do with these numbers. Because in fact, in this case, you take that 2.4 million and you now subtract the 230 closing balance and um, add the 156 opening balance, and she would get 2326000 if she were to do that correctly. And so now she submits for grading. Thank you very much. She's told she submitted successfully. She needs to get at least three out of five to move on. So let's go and have a look at how she actually did. She goes to the tests and quizzes, and she sees here uh, that John, at this point here, she got Five out of five, how fantastic. Um, if she was looking for feedback, she could click here. And in fact, she got lucky with that B. She was absolutely right. And the feedback simply says, yes, well done. If she had been wrong, the, the feedback would tell her why she was wrong and why the correct answer is what it is. She was right about this one and right about that one. She can feel great about this and she can move on now to lesson four. You can see it's no longer grayed out and off she goes into lesson four, or she saves it for tomorrow because she's had enough of accounting for today. What about on our side? Um, as the instructor, uh, I am looking down here in my tests and quizzes tool. I can see that same lesson that she's just completed. There it is, lesson three of week seven. She's now one of 169 students that's completed it. If I click over there, I can see scores for all of those students who have completed it, and you can see uh, a few of our students here who've done very nicely. Uh, if I want to, I could go and have a look at a user activity report here. Why don't I have a look at how Dummy2 has done? Here she is. Um, you can see that she has completed the three lessons of the statement of cash flows, uh, and she's got 100% there. She didn't do so well in these previous ones. What's very concerning about her is that she's really done very few of these lessons. If she were to write to me and say, Jimmy, I did so badly on test one, I don't know what to do. I could just have a quick look here and I could say, well, you need to engage more with the course. You need to be more like, for example, dummy student one, um, who has a record of achievement that looks like this. Uh, many uh, attempts at uh, all of these different knowledge checks and some great marks too. Look at this, 100%, a few 80s and 90s. Um, coming through there. And that's, that's the sign of a student who's really been engaging with all of our activities. Fantastic. So, of course, this is a very precise usage of a particular tool. In fact, three different elements of one learning platform. So there isn't literature about this particular innovation per se. But we did have a question about it in the student evaluations recently and you can see that 94-95% agreed with the prompt that the knowledge checks are useful. Now that's quite something when you think that this is extra work for students, right? They don't tend to like extra work, certainly not 95% uh, of them. And you can see that almost three quarters of the class actually strongly agree 
that they were valuable. So uh, I just thought I'd share a few comments which really draw out some of the great advantages, I think, of the knowledge checks. And those first two really, by mentioning engagement and interactivity, I think are pointing to the idea that this forces them to be active learners because they have to actually participate in the process. They have to force themselves to actually remember stuff from the learning activity um, and go back if they haven't got it right. Um, I like that second comment emphasizes the immediacy of this active learning. You know, if you watch a video for 15 minutes, maybe you'll do some of the uh, additional recommended activities, perhaps not. But within a half an hour, you're basically having to force yourself to remember what you've learned. Um, uh, I like this comment here that emphasizes deep learning. Uh, another one here that uh, talks about two features that a lot of students commented on. One is that, of course, they are able to identify the gaps in their understanding, their weaknesses. And the other is that they can see from the questions we ask what we consider to be the most important aspects of the lesson, which quite often the students themselves haven't picked up on. And so this is a great way for them to be able to do that. And then I love this last com comment about it being a confidence booster. Uh, earlier in the semester, I asked one of the class reps how the knowledge checks were going, and he said, Oh, I just love it because when I do it and I get five out of five, I feel so great. I just want to move on straight to the next lesson, which was so satisfying to hear. Okay, with that, I'd like to just quickly finish off with a few more thank yous. Thanks again so much to Carla, who has been a rock for me and for the students this semester, taking care of all of the vital functions while I've been messing around with light boards and knowledge checks and such like. Uh, thank you to the SILT team and especially to Thomas and to Tasneem who were very, very helpful, especially in the beginning in setting up the knowledge checks. Um, thank you to the Buller Help Desk. You guys are heroes. I don't know how many uh, hours you must be putting in at the moment, but thank you so much for all you're doing. And especially to Lubavalo, my main man. Wow, calling me back Friday evenings, doesn't matter. Uh, and, and putting in so many hours. Thank you so much, Lubavalo. Uh, thank you lastly to all of you for uh, watching. I really hope that you've got just at least one tiny little idea from my presentation here. Um, maybe you want to go the whole hog and you want to build yourself a light board or implement a full-scale knowledge check system. Please, I am one email away. Here's my email address. I would love to help you as much as you want to be helped. All right. Thanks, everybody.